Hey there guys, welcome back to the second video on cutscenes. So today we're going to go through some examples of how to write some scripts that you can use in your cutscene. But the first thing I want to do is fix a mistake I made in the previous video. So if we just come into our scripts and cutscene and action. So this right here, this should just be a greater than. Because if it was greater than or equal to, then the very last scene would also satisfy this condition. Because the very last scene would be equal to the array length 1D minus 1. So delete that and that should be working properly now. All right, moving on. So now we've already made a cutscene wait function and we had this one as a little example, but let's create some more useful ones. So let's start with some easy ones to begin with. So let's start with playing a sound. So I'm gonna call this cutscene play sound. Now I'm actually gonna make this script closely resemble the function that already exists to play a sound. So that's audio play sound. And you can see it takes in a sound, a priority, and asks whether we want to loop the sound or not. And that's exactly the arguments I'm going to ask for in this script. And really, we only need to set this up at all just because this script can't be saved in the way that we have set up our cutscenes like these scripts can. So basically, we've just created a method to stall until the time that we actually need to run the script with the appropriate number of arguments. And this is going to be the case for quite a few of them. So for example, for changing variables and creating and destroying instances, they'll basically look exactly like the functions that were created to do just this, but we need to create them ourselves. All right, so the first one is just that sound ID priority and whether it loops. And then we can just pass in argument zero, argument one, and argument two. And the only other thing we need to do is just call cutscene and action so that we go to the next one. All right, so let's do one for cutscene instance create. So I'm going to make this kind of an analog of instance create layer. So this will just create an instance at a certain x, y position in a certain layer. And then you specify what object you want. So this requires a x, y, a layer ID, and then an object. We call cutscene and action. And I just want to return this value here. So I'm going to go var inst so that we're saving the ID. And then we can return it. So we don't really need to do this, but I'm just going to do it just in case. All right, another one for cutscene instance destroy. So now the instance destroy function, generally we want to call it when we sort of go with an object and then we have it destroy itself. So what I'm going to do is ask for the ID of the object. So now if you give it, if I just say OBJ player or something or OBJ enemy, if it went with OBJ enemy, that would go with every single instance of OBJ enemy and then have it run this code. So that would destroy every single enemy. But if you wanted to only destroy one specific enemy, you would have to give it the precise ID of that one instance, which you can do by using functions like instance find or even by getting the ID when you create it. But that's just something to keep in mind if you're going to use this function. So on that note, what you could do is create a kind of alternate one. Cutscene instance destroy nearest. And basically it would do the same thing as this one, except we're going to ask for a X and Y position as well as the object ID. And we're going to kind of assume that we are just going to be giving it the object index, so OBJ enemy or something. And then it will look at this location, find the nearest instance, and then it will destroy that one. So let's find that one. So we can use instance nearest. So, and then we just give it these two arguments here. Like that. So this will return the ID of that instance that is nearest to this point. It'll save it in this right here. So now we can actually just run cutscene instance destroy. Because that one just takes in an object ID. And one thing we will have to add here though, of course, is cutscene and action. So we don't have to add that here because it will already be doing that by calling this. So it finds it, runs this, jumps to here, and it will run that. All right, so that's those two. And hopefully you're getting the idea by now of how to create these scripts by yourself. So another one we can quickly do is cutscene 
change X scale and that was one of the ones I was showing in that little preview when I had the characters kind of looking left and right. So all I was doing here was I was taking in, so we just need an object, an image X scale to change. And basically all I have to do is go with argument zero and then set their image X scale equal to argument one. And of course, cutscene and action. Now I'm going to tweak this a little bit because sometimes when I have constructed a big cutscene, I don't really know what direction the object is facing, but I just want it to be flipped. So I'm actually going to make this argument right here optional. So I need a way of saying that we don't actually have to give this argument. And if we don't specify it, so if I just give it an object, it's just going to flip its index instead of setting it to a specific value. So. The way that we do this, and this is sort of a method that you use every time you want to have optional arguments, is that you have to get the arguments in a kind of special way. If you want argument one to be optional, then you can't reference it like this. So what we do instead is I'm actually going to make an array of arguments. and I'm going to initialize this as arg, and then I'm going to loop through using a repeat loop, right? So we've just made a loop that's going to repeat however many arguments that we put into the script, right? The argument count. So if we put in one, this is going to loop one time. And if we put in two, it's going to loop two times. And every loop, what I'm going to do is set the I entry. So this one is going to start at zero and then every loop it's going to be incremented. So we start at zero and I'm going to set that equal to the contents of that argument. So basically this just creates an array here with all of the argument values in a way that we don't have to directly reference argument zero or argument one. And now I'm just going to check if argument count is greater than one, then in that case, I know that I put both of these into it and I will want to run this. But otherwise, I want to do something similar, but instead of setting it equal to argument one, because that doesn't exist in this case, all I'm doing is I'm going to flip whatever image X scale is. So if it is currently one, then it's going to equal minus one. Or even if it's five, it will be minus five and vice versa. Cool. So that's just an example of how you'd make a more variable script. Now let's tackle another sort of harder one. Let's do cutscene change variable. So this one is super useful because often in your game, as a result of something that happens in the cutscene, you might want to change an object variable irrevocably so that it has an effect on your game world. So for example, you might want to change the player's maximum health or something. If they've just been awarded something that increases their health, you might want to change the sprite index of the character. So we're going to just set this up so that no matter what variable you hand it, it's going to change that variable. So the first argument I'm going to ask for is the object whose variable I want to change. So for example, the sprite index of my player. So I would give it the player's ID. And again, the same thing that we were discussing with instance destroy is going to apply here. So if we give it just an object index, it's going to apply this to all of the objects. But if we give it a specific ID, it will just happen to that one object. So next I'm going to put the variable name as a string. So for example, sprite index, you would just write sprite index, but with those sort of commas around it. And next we want a value, a new value to change that variable to. So what we're going to do is go with argument zero, right? So that would be the object. And we're going to go variable instance set ID argument one, argument two. And then at the end we call cutscene and action. All right. Now, finally, let's try a bit of a harder one. Let's create cutscene move character. So this is if you ever want to move your character in a cutscene. So if you think about it, we're going to need quite a few arguments here. So we're going to need the object ID, just like a lot of our other ones. So an X and Y location to move it to. And next, if you think about it, we might want to move the object to a specific coordinate that we've worked out in the room, or we might want to just move it, for example, 30 pixels to the right relative to its current position. So the next argument I'm going to ask for is if I want that X and Y to be relative or absolute. And finally, you're going to get the speed at which we want the player to move. Now, unlike all pretty much of the previous scripts that we've created, so all of these, they kind of, they do one thing and then they end. So they only sort of take one step, but the move script, 
This one is actually going to have to run probably multiple times. So it might take quite a few seconds for this character to actually reach its destination. And there is a lot of ways that you can move an object in a game and you might want to tweak this depending on how you set up your movement. The script I'm going to demonstrate right here isn't going to have any collision, for example, and I'm sort of just going to be using vectors to move us towards a position. So first off, because this is running multiple times every step, the very first step is probably going to be special because that's when we're setting it up. So if, for example, we're moving the character 30 pixels over where it currently is, we need a way of saving in the first frame where exactly we want the character to end up. And we need that to save across the different steps. So we can't just deal with temporary variables here. We're actually going to need to set up a couple of instance ones. So in the cutscene object, I'm going to set up two variables, xdest and ydest for x and y destination. And we'll initialize them at just minus one. And actually, just to make things a little bit easier for us, I might just set up some temporary variables so that we don't have to refer to things as argument zero or argument one. I'll just call them obj equals argument zero, relative equals argument three, and speed for argument four. So now I'm going to deal with the case where we're running this for the first time. And I know that we're running it for the first time if x destination and y destination haven't been updated. So if x destination is minus one, that means we haven't done the setup yet. All right, so if it's not relative, then I'm just going to set x dest to argument one, so this x value, and y dest for argument two. So that's if it's not relative. But if it is, then we don't want just argument one and argument two, we want obj.x plus argument one and obj.y plus argument two. All right, so now we are going to have to go with our object, and now we're going to move it. So now have a think. If our object is down here and where we want to end up is up here, then we can kind of draw a line between them. And this line you can think of as a vector, which is just a line with a direction. And now we can't move to this spot immediately, probably. We're constrained by whatever the speed variable was that we set in the argument. So the length of that vector that we're going to move is going to have a length of speed. And then we can get the horizontal and the vertical components of the vector to determine how much we want to change the x and y coordinates of the object. So we know the first point, that's just the x and y position of the object, and then the end point is the x dest and the y dest. But because remember, these variables, they belong to obj cutscene, they do not belong to our object that we're moving with. So we have to declare these as local variables because that way we can reference them still within this object. Unlike these instance variables where the scope of these is just within that one instance, nothing else can access it. All right, so first let's work out the direction that we need to go. So we're going to declare a temporary variable dir for direction equal to point direction. So, and that gets, like I said, the direction kind of a vector between two points. And those two points is the x and y coordinates of the object and then the x destination and the y destination, which we set as xx and yy. All right, now we can use that direction to calculate a length. So I'm going to call this elder x for length direction x. So this is the horizontal component of the vector. This is how far we need to move along the x axis. All right, so we use a length der x, and then it asks for a length and a direction. So we go speed, which is this here, and then the direction we just worked out. All right, and then we do the same for the y. Cool, and then we just go x plus equals elder x and y plus equals elder y. But there is a problem with this. So say we have run this script a few times and we're really close to the destination now. And actually we're so close that if we moved another vector with the length of speed, we would actually overshoot it. So if that's the case, we don't want to move there. We just want to say that we just want to kind of jump to the actual destination itself. And then we want to finish because we have reached our destination. So we need to put a check in here to so just check if point distance between our object itself and then the destination is greater than or equal to speed. Only then do we want to do all of this. But otherwise, we are close enough that we can finish and just set x equal to xx. 
and y equal to yy. And in this case, we want to kind of exit this with statement and come back to our cutscene because now we have actually finished the scene and we need to call cutscene and action. So to do this, we can just go with other call cutscene and action. And I'm also going to reset x dest and y dest back to minus one so that we're ready for the next action. So now remember, because of the nature of these with statements, if you were getting this an object index and it was moving multiple instances of an object, the first one that calls this is going to get to this point and run the end action. And basically the cutscene will proceed to the next scene and it's not going to continue this for the rest. So be mindful that you do need to give it a specific instance. As a little note, something you might want to add is a way to control. If we're moving a character, we might first want to change its sprite index. So what I've done in my objects, so in their create events, I have set some variables here. So for example, SPR walk, and then I've stored the sprite that it uses for walking and the sprite that it uses for idle. And I've done that for all of my objects. So that means in this script, I can just say, set the object sprite index to whatever it's walking sprite is. So that way I don't have to specify this, the precise sprite name. And then I can do the same for when it's finished. And to get it changing directions, what I can do is just check if the elder x, so this thing right here, if it's not equal to zero, because if it is equal to zero, we don't want it flipping. Then I'm going to set image x scale equal to whatever the sign of elder x is. So that is kind of getting whether this is positive or negative. So if we're moving to the right, it's going to be positive and it's going to set the image x scale equal to one because the sign is either one or minus one. All right, so that is it for today. So hopefully you can use a lot of the techniques that we've gone through here to make your own scripts as well. Next time we're going to sort of polish off everything that we've been working on so far and go through constructing a cutscene. Thanks for watching guys. So this video was chosen by a vote on Patreon. So thank you to everyone who voted and thanks for supporting me to make these tutorials. Some special shout outs to Adrian S, Amy Serra, Antonio Capo, Colin McLernan, Cursed Toast, Danielle Hargrave, Doan Techman, Fosco, Ian Seckington, Max Molinaro, Ricky C, Semi Metal Alchemist, Semi Myth, Straya Moon, Stuart Wells, The Great Poultry, Thomas M, and XD Game Studio. I hope you guys are well, and I'll see you in the next video.